Good evening to and welcome to another installment of Biblical History, the Book of Judges. Um, we are learning about the prophets and about the judges and about the uh, difficulties that the Jewish people had in maintaining their connection to God. And um, they kept following the uh, idolatry, and as a result of that, God would uh, leave them. And um, then an, a, an outside enemy would come, and um, they would then finally turn to God and uh, ask for help, and God would send a uh, judge, a shofet, uh, and they would get better, and then the whole process would start all over again. So we, we see that there's a bit of a cycle going on here. And um, this is, unfortunately, the, the nature of the Book of Shoftim. Um, it means that you're stuck in a cycle and you're not able to get out of it. Uh, so things are good for a bit, and then you fall off the wagon, so to say, uh, and then you start the whole process over again. Uh, the last chapter we discussed was chapter 11, which I, if you recall, I mentioned that this seems to be a, a tipping point in a negative tipping point in the way that the uh, story of the Jewish people, the history of the Israelites is going. Uh, what starts out is promising that each tribe is in their own land, in their own section, and they are, uh, in theory, you know, all connected by a, uh, a central um, temple. The temple was not in Jerusalem yet, but the temple was in uh, Shiloh, and they had prophets, um, and they had priests. So everything that the Torah commanded or, or vision, envisioned um, was supposed to take place. Uh, what ended up happening, unfortunately, was that each tribe kind of went into their own little bubble. So the unity of the Jewish people, once they got to the land of Israel and they dispersed, the unity was called into question. This is an important idea when we think about um, the next uh, book that we're going to uh, explore, which is the book of Samuel, um, that book really uh, is based on this notion that there was a feeling that, the, you know, that there's disharmony and worse. And actually in this chapter we're going to discuss is going to uh, uh, teach us about um, what happens when um, Jews, Israelites turn on each other. Um, and uh, it's leading us towards a downward spiral of a, just a terrible period in Jewish history where um, Jews are fighting against Jews, Jews are killing Jews, uh, there's animosity um, 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 between tribes, Jews are not uh, letting other tribes uh, come close to them, and uh, you really, it's a recipe for a true disaster. Uh, if we remember the last story, the last story was about a man named Gideon, and he was successful. I'm sorry, the last story was a man, was a man named Yiftach, uh, and he was successful, but, you know, and we get to this idea, successful but, successful but. He was successful, uh, but he sacrificed his own daughter, if we remember the end of the story, and he was a son of a... Uh, of a prostitute, which seems to mean that he was an outsider, and the people didn't like him originally, and they only used him to help him because he was a gibor chayel, he was a, 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 a heroic, valiant personality, but obviously misguided because he ended up um, doing this terrible thing to his child, um, misunderstanding the, the Torah laws, and not going and seeking um, guidance from the priests at the time, or certainly not from the prophet at the time. Now, the story was uh, that he was in a, a tribe called, a land called Menashe, and he was fighting against the people from Ammon. And that uh, seems to be what takes place in this story, except at the end of the story, he seeks, he, he's victorious, he succeeds. And in chapter 39, in verse 39, um, I'm sorry, in verse, uh, um, Sorry. Ah, um, in verse 33, he, he destroys the, uh, the enemy from Ammon, uh, 20 cities and, and the, you know, a major, major defeat. And this, the Ammonites surrendered to Israel. And you'd think that that was a fantastic uh, conclusion to the story. And yet in chapter 12, something very, very 
bad happens, okay? I'm sorry. Chapter 12 starts a fight between the people of Ephraim and the people of, uh, to Yiftach. Yiftach, remember, was from Menashe. And it says the men of Ephraim came across the Jordan to a place called Tzaphon. And they said to Yiftach, why, didn't you mar- not, why did you march to fight the Ammonites without calling us to go with you? We will burn your house down over you. Now that is a extreme position here. Like, okay, so, so you know, it sounds like they didn't, Yiftach didn't ask for help. So why do you go burn the house? We have to remember, what happens when you win a war? Okay, when you win a war, you get the spoils. So, and Yiftach is going to say this in a second, when there was a war that they didn't know they were going to win, so no one wanted to help Yiftach. When he defeats, when he's victorious, so all of a sudden everyone wants to be a part of it and everyone wants to come with complaints. How dare you fight alone? Well, Yiftach didn't like this answer. And Yiftach says in, chapter, in verse 2, I and my people were in a bitter conflict with the Ammonites, and I called you, but you didn't come. And when I saw that there were no saviors, I risked my life and went against the Ammonites and the Lord delivered them to me. Now you're coming to fight against me? So the backstory here is that this is a civil war between tribes. It takes place because the Ephraimites uh, are, are feel, feel like they, they were insulted, that they lost out, that they, they didn't get their, 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 their dividends and, um, and, and they, they came to battle against Yiftach. Well, Yiftach gathers the uh, men of Gilad, and he fights against the Ephraimites. Now, at this point, you have to cry. This is the, uh, the first time where uh, brothers of Israel fight with each other. There is a civil war, and Jews are murdering Jews. Jews are fighting against other Jews from another tribe. Unfortunately, this is the beginning, but nowhere near the end. The Bible, unfortunately, is riddled with stories of, um, of internal tribal um, wars and, um, mur- and hun- tens and tens of thousands die, maybe hundreds of thousands die at the hands of Jews. Now, um, there's no reason to point fingers here, right? I mean, this is just, you know, Yiftach is is defending himself, but uh, there's some kind of animosity and some dissonance, and therefore, um, the the Bible tells this story as if it's telling us a story of Yiftach fighting against the external enemy, but this time it's an internal enemy. So the Giladites, right, fought against the Ephraimites, and, um, and they fought against them, and they defeated them and pushed them out of, um, uh, out of their land. But there were some refugees from Ephraim who were living amongst Menashe. And there, so they were like this fifth column, and they, 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 they were trying to weed out the uh, people from... Um, from Ephraim, from the Menashes. And, they, and people would, would say, hey, are you an Ephraimite? And if they did, then they would obviously uh, have you know, some serious issues with him. They would kick him out, they would kill him, they would do terrible things because of the fear of an Ephra- a person from Ephraim who was amongst the people from Menashe. Now, the problem was that all the Jews seem like uh, similar, um, and therefore it was hard to tell them apart. So people realized that linguistically, actually, their language uh, was a little different. You see, there's a word called shibolet. All right, it just means a grain of uh, a, a, a stalk of wheat. Um, but uh, the um, the Ephrites, uh, people from Ephraim, they would say sibolet. They couldn't pronounce the shin. So this is the famous term, the shibboleth test. Okay, it's that, that test where you can distinguish between two types of people based on a word they use because it's common vernacular. This word is used on the east side of the Jordan, and it's said this way. This year, on the, on the west side of Jordan, it's said it another way. And therefore, this shibboleth sibboleth test became known, and um, it is something that um, 
unfortunately, if, if they found out that the person couldn't say Shibolet, but said Sibolet, then they would slay him, okay? Um, this is important because it's setting the, the background for a, what's going to be is a, a, a gruesome uh, battle uh, between the tribes. Um, but we'll put it on hold. All right, it's just a little story, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll tell about another uh, pro, a priest, a uh, judge, I'm sorry, and his name is uh, Ivtsan. He's from Beit Lechem. And he had 30 sons and 30 daughters. That's a lot. And he was the judge for seven years. Um, and then there was another um, judge who was in the land of Zvulun, and he judged for 10 years. And there was another judge, his name was Avdon, and he uh, judged for eight years. Um, what we're learning out, the impression that I get here is that there, there's no unity, there's no center, there's no one main leader, but there are individuals who take the mantle of leadership and it lasts for as long as they are around. And once they die, then there's, once again, anarchy. And the people of Israel are kind of looking for a leader that they could look up to, they could, uh, they could rally around, because there are always enemies from the outside. And then um, we meet chapter 13. And chapter 13 starts our story with someone, a biblical personality that many people are familiar with. His name is... Shimshon. Now it takes uh, three or four chapters. We'll do part of it tonight and part of it next week. Um, it begins in an ominous way. It says the Israelites again did uh, evil in the eyes of God. And as a result, God punishes them by making them uh, per persecuted by the Plishtim, the Philistines, for 40 years. Who are the Philistines? Who are the Plishtim? The word liflosh means to invade. So it seems like they were a foreign invader. And according to archaeologists, they came from Greece um, because uh, they uncovered the pottery of the Philistines was similar to the pottery that they found in, uh, in, in the uh, Greek islands uh, from ancient times. So these, and, and therefore these, they, since they came and they were seafarers, their god was called Dagon, which means the fish god. Okay, and they, these seafarers, their, their main city centers were on the coast of, uh, city states, I'm sorry, were, were on the coast of, uh, of the, the Mediterranean, um, in, in the Israeli coast, and you had Aza, and you had uh, Gat, and you had Ashdod, and you had Ekron, and you had Ashkelon. Um, so they, uh, and they kept, you know, um, invading, uh, eastward, and, uh, and they caused a lot of havoc, and they, they caused havoc for hundreds of years uh, to the Jewish people. Um, and then the, 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 the Bible tells us a story. There was a man from um, Tzorah, which is near Beit Shemesh, okay, from the tribe of Dan, and his name was Manoach, and his wife had no children. And the, 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 the angel of God appears to the wife and says to her, you are um, barren, but I'm telling you now, you will become pregnant and have a child. But I'm telling you this, do guard him from wine and beer and anything related to impure. And also, when you give child, birth to the child, no um, knife, can be, no razor can touch his head. Why? And this is something that uh, we're familiar with from a biblical perspective, because he will be a nazir from the stomach, from the womb. He will be a nazir, and then he will be the salvation from the Egyptian, from the Philistines. Now, what is a nazir? There's a verse in the Bible, in the fourth book in Bamidbar, that there is a person who, if <clears throat> he so chooses, he can nazir, which means refrain from engaging in the pleasures of life. The pleasures of life would be um, drink, wine, beer, um, 
t engaging with people, all types of people, because when you have to stay away from people who might be impure. So basically, you, you're a hermit almost. You stay away from everyone. And also, his hair will be uh, unkempt. Okay, this is the uh, uh, a law that you may become a nazir. It's, it lasts for thirty days, or you can make a vow to do it for longer. But there is a beginning time and an end time. Why does a person want to do this? A person wants to do this because he feels that, or she feels that they are uh, lacking a certain spirituality. They're missing. They are on one side of the spectrum or, or the pendulum and they need an extra boost. Now, why am I telling you this? Because as opposed to uh, other religions where this, this might be considered as an ideal, certain ascetic lifestyle, a monastic lifestyle, a lifestyle that you prevent from yourself the luxuries of life. Um, in Judaism, this is just for a very, very small, marginalized fragment of the community that feels that they need it for a certain time, and then they come back to the world, they come back to being engaged in uh, everything else, everyone uh, that everyone else is doing. However, there are certain unique individuals that for some reason are considered Nazir, Nazir, Nazir Nazarites, Nazirim, from birth, which means for their whole life, they, they act like this. So therefore, there are certain individuals that are really set aside from everyone, um, and they're a Nazir. Samuel, by the way, is a Nazir, okay? Uh, doesn't mean you don't get married, by the way. You do get married, you do have children, but from the other uh, pleasures of life, you do not engage. So um, there is, this, so the angel of God tells uh, the wife that you're going to have a child, but you have to make sure he's a Nazir. Now, I wonder if, based on what I said, is that the Nazir is created because there seems to be something lacking. So is this not perhaps a boost from God, a divine directive? that maybe the leader needs to um, engage and in, in, enhance, heighten his spiritual component, kind of like, hey, society is in a place right now where people are very unspiritual, you need to go to the other direction. Um, and maybe that will kind of, kind of balance out the, the system. Um, well, we'll see what happens, okay? Uh, verse 6, the woman tells her husband, uh, a man of God came to me, and he looked like an angel. I, I didn't ask him who he was, and I didn't, he, didn't, uh, he didn't tell me his name. And he said, you're going to have a child, and don't give him wine, and don't give him uh, if you're, He will be a Nazir. So in verse 8, Manoach, the husband, who really doesn't have a great reputation from this story here, okay, what does he do? He, instead of trusting his wife, um, he calls out to God and he says, please, God, it's a man of, uh, of God who you sent should come again and tell us what to do with this child. Well, God listens to the voice of Manoach and the, the angel of God comes. And she's sitting in, this, in the field, and once again, her husband's not with her. And she runs to the husband and says, oh, he's here, he's here, come. And uh, Manoach goes to, and, and says to the man, uh, are you the man who spoke to my wife? And he says, I am. And Manoach says, um, tell us what to do with this child. So the angel says, everything I told your wife, you should do. Keep him away from vines, keep him away from wine, keep him away from beer, keep him away from impurity. Everything I told her, you should do. I think there's a, sub, a certain subtext here um, that's, uh, that Manoach didn't realize the, the, uh, the worthiness of his wife, and he didn't understand the message of his wife, and maybe his wife didn't understand her own worthiness, because after all, not everyone has a, an angel of God appear before you. And not everyone is deemed to be the mother of the Savior of Israel. And yet, um, she turns to her husband, and she says, uh, what do we do? Um, 
So Manoach says to the angel of God, hey, let's make you some food. Now, this was a common practice for, pre for prophets, and certainly a practice for priests. People need to eat, but not for a man of God. So clearly, they didn't understand this man of God. In verse 16, he says, um, if you make me food, I'm not going to eat it. If you uh, present a, a burnt offering, if you're going to make a sacrifice, may, make it to God. And the, the Navi goes out of the way and says, Manoach did not understand that this was an angel. And Manoach says to the man, what's your name? That I should, you know, I should respect you. I should give you honor. And the angel says, why are you asking my name? This is a wonder. Now, the Navi is going out of its way to tell us of no of Manoach's, of what the wife of Manoach, who by the way is nameless, we don't know her name, but she inherently understood, innately she, she sensed that, uh, inherently understood that this is a man of God. And Manoach just didn't understand. And I wonder if Manoach reflects the, 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 the time period and, and the place to where society, Israeli society has, has reached doesn't understand who is in front of him. Even the very um, person that's standing in front of him, telling him miraculous things, doesn't understand. Manoach takes the, uh, the uh, sacrifice, and puts it on a, a rock, um, and makes it, uh, and, and, um, and, and makes a fire on this like, you know, altar that they created. And the angel of God goes into the fire and goes up in the fire. And Manoach and his wife see this and they fall on their faces. And they, then the Navi says, and the angel never came back. And as a result, Manoach knew that that was an angel of God. And then Manoach says, honey, we're going to die because we saw the face of God. And his wife says, if God had wanted to kill us, he wouldn't have taken us to sacrifice from us, and he wouldn't have told us what to do, and he wouldn't have... That's the whole story, right? So this is like the origin story of Shimshon, is shroud, shrouded in some kind of weird um, mystery that, that hinges on a strange relationship between Manoach and the anonymous Mrs. Manoach. Um, I think that this is important because the story of Shimshon is really, you know, on, on, on some level, it's really a story between about a relationship or a lack of relationship or a, a skewed relationship that men have with women and that women have with men. And uh, this is not uncommon in the story in the book of Judges. We've mentioned that there have been many women who have leadership positions and many women who have been heroes and, and, and therefore, it, it, it seems like a subtext in this story is if you don't realize your own wife and the va her value that you can't even give her a name so then you're blind you're blind to the world around you and that's why i have a negative impression of manoach he can't see the greatness in, of his wife he can't see the value in uh in, in what's in front of him and clearly he's not going to be able to see that an angel of god is for him and the, and the wisdom comes through the mother of Shimshon, the wife of Manoach, and the woman who is to remain nameless. But she has a child, and she calls him Shimshon. It sounds like, you know, like from the sun. The child grows up to a young man, and God blesses him. And the Spirit of God... Um, moves him or, or, you know, rings in him in the camp of Dan between Tzora and Eshtaol. Okay, so this is the backstory, a very powerful story. Um, we, all we know about Shimshon so far is that he is a Nazir. He has long hair. He is very spiritual. And he, um, he is blessed by God. And then, in uh, almost a non sequitur, and in like an unexpected fashion, 
he goes down to a place called Timna, and he sees a woman from Timna who was a Philistine woman. He goes up and he tells his mother and his father, I saw a woman in Timna from the Philistines. I want her as my wife. Now this is a mystery. This is a, who is this Samson? What does it mean? Why is he going to take a Philistine woman? Is there some kind of uh, rhyme or rhythm mess, message in his in his uh, in his actions? I mean, the Philistines are persecuting the Jews, and he wants to marry a, a Philistine woman. And the rabbis say, he goes down. You know, you can go down because geographically it's south. Or you can go down because uh, metaphysically you want to go down to your most base um, feelings and desires. Shimshon sees a woman, says, I must have her. And then his mother and father say in verse 3, are there no... Jewish women in our entire nation that you have to go to the Arelim, the Plishtim, who are circum, uh, uncircum, uncircumcised uh, Plishtim. And Shimshon says, she's who I want. She is right in my eyes. Think about this for a second. Shimshon, who has the spirit of God in him, Shimshon, who is supposed to be the leader, by the way, one of the words for leader is a ro'e, one who sees. Shimshon, Shimshon uses his eyes in the most physical, primal, uh, sexual connotation, sees the woman, desires the woman, says, she is who I want, she is right for my eyes. We will get back to the eyes. Okay, later on in the story. Now, verse 4 is complicated. His father and mother did not realize that this was the Lord's doing. He was seeking a pretext against the Philistines, for the Philistines were ruling over Israel at the time. So, what was the Lord's doing? Right? The Lord didn't program Samson. The Lord, however, caused maybe this seduction such that if that was going to take place, that's how Shimshon, <coughs> excuse me, that's how Shimshon would end up becoming the leader uh, against the Philistines. Um, but this is what happens. So in verse 5, Shimshon, his mother and his fathers go to Timna. And on the way, and here is just a bizarre story. On the way, they encounter a lion. It's running up to them, um, wanting to kill them. Now the spirit of God grips Shimshon and he tears the lion apart with his bare hands. And Shimshon was by himself, so he didn't tell his mother and his father. So apparently the, the strength, which is just a gift from God, um, this happens on the way. He doesn't internalize that, that maybe I should stay with the uh, Israelite woman, but rather uh, in verse 7, he goes and he speaks to this woman, and she is right before his eyes. And um, the, afterwards, they see that the, uh, the, the, uh, the line is torn apart, and there's like uh, honey bees um, coming out of it. Okay? Um, a swarm of bees with honey. So he scooped it into his palms and ate it. And he gave it to his parents and they ate it and didn't tell him what happened. All right? So it's a weird kind of story that, that he sees these, uh, he, sees, he kills an, a, a lion, but in that lion becomes something with the bees um, and he uses it and he's able to eat it. Right? All this will, is like a foreshadowing of something that's going to happen later in the text. Um, so they make, they make a feast. 
and they're sitting there, um, you know, Israelites and Philistines, um, which is quite interesting. Um, It says that there are 30 um, of his friends and companions. Maybe later they have the Philistines there. Anyway, he tells a story and he says, I have a riddle for you, okay? Um, if you can figure it out, I'll give you this great reward. And if you can't, so then you have to give me the reward. So I said, okay, sounds like a great idea. So he says, from food came, uh, from, from that which was eating became something to eat, and something that was strong and powerful became sweet. And no one could figure it out. He was talking about the, uh, the, 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 the lion that, uh, that he was talking about. Um, on the seventh day, they said to Samson's wife, oh, whose day? This is the Philistines. And they said, coax your husband to provide us with the answer to the riddle or else we should put your, you and your father's household to fire. Because we don't want to, we don't want to pay him, okay? So Shimshon's wife comes and cries and says, you must really hate me. You asked my countrymen, the Philistines, for a riddle and you couldn't, didn't tell me the answer. So Shimshon said, well, I haven't tell, even told my father the answer. Why should I tell you? During the rest of the seven days of the feast, she continued to harass him with tears. And the seventh day he told her because she nagged him so, and she told her countrymen. And they, of course, came and said, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And he responded, had you not plowed with my heifer, you would not have guessed my riddle. Which basically means um, <clears throat> you used my wife in order to get um, the riddle. And the story ends the, the, um, that as a result of this, he, um, the Spirit of God gripped him, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of its men, stripped them and gave them sets of clothing to those who had answered the riddle, and he left in a rage for his father's house. And Samson's wife that, that he married uh, had been one of these wedding companions. In other words, in other words, this is a strange story of Samson where he has a lot of intense power and that's called the, the, the grip of, of God's, uh, the spirit of God. And he, um, he nevertheless has this desire to be with these women, okay? This is the savior of the Jewish people. The one who was supposed to be the Nazir, who was supposed to be the purest of the pure, he can't help himself from having this desire, and so much so that when um, he, he uh, um, poses a riddle, he ends up telling them because he tells it through his wife, but his power ends up um, defeating the enemies that, uh, that are around him. This is Shimshon. Another story. In the harvest time, Shimshon came to visit his wife, and he brings them, her a, a, a kid, a, a, uh, an animal, like a little goat. He said, let me go to the chamber with my wife. And the father didn't let. And the father said, listen, you said you hated her. So, uh, you know, so I gave her to someone else. But you know what? Take her sister. She's even better than her. So Shimshon says, uh, now the Philistines can have no claim against me for the harm I shall do to them. In other words, uh, you take my wife, and then you, uh, you say, just take my sis the sister instead. I mean, that, that's not how you treat people. Um, Shimshon uh, got very angry, and he, he, he takes um, 300 foxes, he puts torches on the tails of the foxes, and places a torch between, on the, in the pair of tails. He lights the torches and turns them loose among the grain of the Philistines and sets fire to all, of it, all the vineyards and everything. And the Philistines said, who did this? They were told it was Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, who took Samson's wife and gave her to his wedding companion. 
Thereupon the, the Philistines came up and put her and her father to the fire. Wow. So Samson said to them, if that is how you act, I will not race, rest until I've taken revenge on you. So in other words, um, since Shemshon is the cause of his first wife's demise and her father, because it's the Philistines uh, used her, and then when he kind of took revenge, they took revenge on her, and then he takes revenge back. I'm kind of getting a sense how, you know, what kind of personality this is. It's all physical. It's all kind of um, revenge, and it's all uh, battles. Um, and... Um, and this is the type of uh, way that uh, he's defeating, you know, these uh, these attacks on the uh, on the Philistines. So um, then there's a uh, there's a battle that's going to take place. You know, he goes and he kills a whole bunch of uh, Philistines uh, as a result of this. And um, the, the the Philistines go and uh, camp by Judah, and they they're going to there's going to be a big war. So the, the, Jew, the people of Judah didn't know what's going on. They said to the Philistines, why are you here? They said, we want to arrest, um, we want to arrest Shimshon. We want him in chains for what he did to us. So 3,000 from Judah go to Selah Etam and say to Shimshon, what are you doing? You know, the Philistines are going, are, are going to destroy us. What have you done to us? And he says to them, Kasher Asuli, Cannot see to him. An eye for an eye. They did it to me, so I am going to do it back to them. So um, the story continues. Um, unfortunately, we might not make it to the end of our pod uh, of our uh, recording. Um, I'm leaving you in a bit of a cliffhanger here. Uh, The, the story is that the, the, the battle is, is going to take place. Of course, Shimshon takes up, and he is there to, uh, to fight against them. And um, he said, the Philistine says, we will only take you prisoner and hand you over to them. I'm sorry, the, 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 the people of Judah says, we're going to take you prisoner. We're going to hand you over to them. They won't kill you. Don't worry, we're not going to kill you. They bound Shimshon with ropes. And, uh, you know, and they, uh, they're giving him over. Can you imagine the people of Judah um, arrest him so that uh, they're taking over so that he doesn't have to, uh, so that they're not going to be in, in trouble. They don't, they're not going to be persecuted. Of course, they're binding Shimshon, and he's, he has the power of 100 men. So that's exactly what happened in verse, uh, when you, in verse 14, when he reaches Lehi, the Philistines come shouting to him, but then the spirit of the Lord grips him and the ropes of his arm become like, catches fire and the bonds melted off. So the, the story is that, uh, that the, the Israelites, the, tra the tribe of Judah, which is like this very important tribe, they arrest Shimshon. And they say, even though Shimshon is fighting on behalf of the Jewish people, well, he's fighting on behalf of Shimshon. Okay, but there, if he's fighting against the, the enemy, and you know what they say to him? Stop fighting the enemy. You're causing us to be, you know, in, persecuted more. So they arrest Shimshon. He says, I, uh, I'll go with you quietly on condition that you don't harm me. All right? So we don't want Jews killing Jews. They said, no, 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 we're not going to harm you. We're just going to give you to the Philistines. Can you imagine? This is the worst thing in the world. It's called a Moser. When you give away your own people to the enemy, they're going to kill him. So they put him in chains. And um, when he saw the Philistines running out and so excited, once again, the Spirit of God found him and he rips off the chains. And he takes a jawbone of an ass. I guess it's very strong. Okay, it's very powerful. And he kills a thousand people with it. So there's, a, there's a battle, right, of Shimshon against the entire army of the people of the Philistines at that time, or in that specific area. 
and he killed a thousand of them. And then Shimshon says, with the jaw of an ass, mass upon mass, which means I killed many, many, okay? With his jaw of an ass, I killed a thousand men. As a result of that, they call the place jawbone, like lechi, okay? Another story, verse 18, he was very thirsty and he called out to the Lord and said, you granted me this great victory, but now I'm gonna die of thirst. And I'm gonna be fall into the hands of the uncircumcised. So God split open the hollow, which is at Lehi, and the water gushed out of it. Another miracle. There's some kind of uh, machtesh, which means like a, a rock or a mountain, a range. And God like split it all of a sudden. There was some kind of uh, you know fissure, and water came out of it. And this seems to be, well, like concluding our story that he now be judges during the time of the Plishtim for 20 years. What have we learned? And <laughs> this is only part one of the story, okay? What have we learned? We've learned that he is a complicated biblical hero. We can't not say that he's a biblical hero because he does heroic things and the, sometimes the hand of God is, is upon him. In fact, he seems to be designated, sent by God. But we also see he's a, quite a flawed person. He has, uh, you know, wandering eyes. He has uh, great desires. He's impetuant. He's uh, very violent. He, there's no spiritual, you know, word coming out of him, okay? Except when he calls out to God, which he does. But I would say that he is a, he's like a broken judge. He's a broken um, biblical hero. Not broken in, in physically because he's, physically, he's the opposite. He's like this massive, uh, you know, phenomenon. But he's just, he's missing something. And I can't help but think that this is a reflection of the people at the time. You know, the judge, the leader is, is, is basically as good as the people who appoint them the leader. Right? In politics, you know, that's also sometimes part of the job where, where you see a leader who's uh, this horrible person. Uh, and you have to, you can't just point at the leader. The, who, people vote for a leader. So uh, you have to understand, you know, that this is a reflection of society. Chapter 16. He goes to Aza, which is Gaza, goes to see a Philistine prostitute, sleeps with her. Now, the Gazans learn that, uh, that he, uh, Samson, the great Samson, is shacking up with a, with a, with a prostitute. So they, they, they gather and lay in ambush for him the whole night. And they say, when Dela comes, we're going to kill him. But Samson got up in the middle of the night. And he grabbed the, the gates of the city and he pulled them with the whole bar. And he placed it on his shoulders and carried them off to Hebron. In other words, he miraculously got out of another event that he was going to be killed. Why was he going to be killed? Because he needed to see a prostitute. Third story. And this is the most famous one. He falls in love with another Philistine woman in Nachal Sorek. Her name is Delilah, or in Delilah. Okay, Delilah. He falls in love with Delilah. Now, the heads of the Philistines, right? He's the thorn in their side. And he says to, uh, they say to her, seduce him and we'll find out where his strength comes from and how we can defeat him. And then we will overpower him, tie him up, and we will give you 11 
hundred shekels of silver. Delila doesn't think twice. This is the Delila, okay? I don't understand anyone who names a child Delila. She marries Shimshon, turns to him one night and says, where did your strength come from? And how can you be tied up and made helpless? Now, it's obvious. Shimshon knows what she's doing. And he toys with her a bit, but ultimately it's his downfall. But he knows, he sees that, that, and he can't control himself. So first he plays with her and them, right? She so says, if I were to be tied with seven fresh tendons, like, you know, um, animal hide, or uh, I should become as weak as an ordinary man. Right? And in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, they tie him up in these tendons, and they say, oh, we've got him, we're going to get him. Um, and, of course, he, uh, he pulls it apart and uh, you know, he gets out of it. So Delilah says, you deceived me. You lied to me. Please tell me how you can be tied up. He said, if I were to be bound with new ropes that had never been used, I would become as weak as an ordinary man. Verse 12 says, you know, just tells her buddies, but he tore off them, tore them off his arms like a thread. So she keeps saying, why are you deceiving me? Why are you lying to me? If you weave seven locks onto my head into a web, and that's exactly what she did. And of course, he pulled it all out. So in verse 15, she turns to her and says, how can you say you love me? when you don't confide in me. This makes three times that you've deceived me and haven't told me. And finally, after she had nagged him, she distressed him so much, he finally was like, he wanted to die from this woman who he died for. And, he saw, and then he finally told her the truth. He said, I'm a Nazarene. Nazarite, and I never shaved, and my strength comes from my keeping my uh, laws of being a Nazir. God is, uh, you know, um, protects me, and God gives me strength as a result of my being a Nazir. So she saw that, um, that he was telling the truth, and. Uh, she finally told her, her, her townsmen, her countrymen, and um, she lulled him to sleep on her lap. And then she called in a, a man and they cut off his hair. And in fact, she, made, she weakened him and made him helpless. And she cried, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And he awoke from his sleep, thinking that he would break loose and shake himself. But he didn't, because the Lord left him once he broke the laws of being a Nazir. And what did the Philistines do when they caught him? They gouged out his eyes. Remember, we talked about his eyes, right? And so everything he felt and everything he did was through his eyes. And that was, to him, the... Uh, the, the way that the, the, he saw the world, regardless of the spiritual, the metaphysical, and they gouge out his eyes. And they bring him to Gaza and shackle him in bronze uh, chains, and he becomes a slave in the prison. But then the hair starts to grow back. Okay. Now, the, the, in verse 23, the lords of the Philistines offer a great sacrifice to their god, Dagon. And they chanted, God, you delivered us, our, uh, our enemy, Samson. And Samson was tied to the, the gate, you know, and everyone was making fun of him. And uh, they, uh, they, brought him, they, they brought him from the prison and they tied, he, he had to dance before them, like total humiliation. And they put him between the pillars. Now, in ancient times, these pillars were the, uh, the entire building was resting on pillars, okay? And if you, you know, if you uh, had uh, all the strength on two pillars, that's where uh, it was most, you know, the strongest part of the building. 
So they tied him there and he's standing there. His hands are, are tied and they're making fun and they're laughing at him. And there are 3,000 people inside the building and everyone is being merry and everyone is um, uh, making fun of Shimshon. And of course, they're making fun of the God of Shimshon. And here in verse 28 is the first time that we get a sense that Shimshon has a spiritual moment. And Samson called the Lord and he said, Oh Lord God, please remember me and give me strength just this once, O oh God, to take revenge on the Philistines, if only for one of my two eyes. But wait, there's more. He embraces the two middle pillars that the temple is resting upon, one with his right arm and one with his left arm. And he Samson says, let me die with the Philistines, which is tamut nafshi im plishtim, which means I'm ready to give my life as long as I can take the Philistines with me. And he pulled with all his might. The temple came crashing down on the Lord and all the people in it. And those who were there slain by him as he died outnumbered those who were slain by him when he lived. And his brothers and his father came down and carried him up and buried him in the tomb of his father in Manoach between Sarah and Eshtoel, and he led Israel for 20 years. That's our story of Shimshon. Is it a happy story? No. Is it a spiritual story? No. Is it a story of uh, a, 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 a shofet? Yes not in terms of judging the people, but in terms of saving the people. But the way in which he saved them is reflective of a nation that is sorely missing their spiritual components. They're not guided by the godliness. They're worrying about themselves. They're willing to give up Jews um, to the enemy. And the one who is the savior has all of these flaws. And the salvation comes through death and destruction. I can't help but seeing this as an, a, a metaphor, right? God chooses Shimshon because he knows that this flawed hero represents a flawed nation that somehow still survives during this period of the judges, somehow goes forward despite all of their faults, but it's nothing is pretty, nothing is clean, nothing is neat. Everything is, is, is torturous and chaotic. And in one last moment of, uh, of, uh, of death, he, he manages to find a moment of spirituality. So when is Samson the, the holiest? Is when he's about to die. And even then, he still does it to gain revenge for himself, as opposed to revenge for, you know, against God's people. 